Hey guys, John Thompson, Spring Framework Guru here. Today we're going to talk about inversion of control. It's a very core concept to the Spring Framework. Now we can't get into a discussion of inversion control without mentioning Martin Fowler. Uh, Martin is a, a well-known computer scientist, uh, one of those pioneers that was out there on the speaking circuit uh, talking about object-oriented programming and good code and how to write it and write efficient, clean code. And he's one of the, the people that first started really talking about inversion control and made the whole concept prop popular uh, before the Spring Framework came out. So Martin says, uh, inversion control is a key part of what makes a framework different to a library. A library is essentially a set of functions that you can call these days usually organize into classes. Each call does some work and then returns control to the client. So what he's saying there is basically it, there's a lot of Java libraries out there and they go out and do stuff. Okay, You can get, a, get the library like Apache has some things that will do uh, string formatting. So, um, and you get, the, get a hold of that library and you can use that library and format strings from your code. So that's not what a, a framework will do for you. Martin goes on to say, a framework embodies some abstract design with more behavior built in. In order to use it, you need to insert your behavior into various places in the framework, either by subclassing or by plugging in your own classes. The framework's code then calls your code at these points. So what Martin is describing is like a behavioral and uh, an environment for your code to run in. So the framework's gonna be like a wrapper around your code. Yeah, so it's more than a library. It's something that's gonna be working in conjunction with your code. And we also need to talk about we also need to talk about dependency inversion principle. It's an object-oriented principle that was coined by Robert C. Martin. Uh, he's also affectionately known as Uncle Bob. So Uncle Bob says high-level modules should not depend upon low-level modules. Both should depend upon abstractions goes on to say abstractions should not depend upon details details should depend upon abstractions so this really ties into uh, where we looked at dependency injection to uh, code to an interface not an actual concrete implementation so the interface defi defines your touch point and that interface can be used in different ways so this is a really important uh, program uh, object-oriented programming paradigm that we need to understand when we're talking about inversion of control. So it's really easy to get confused between dependency injection and inversion of control. What I want you to remember about dependency injection, it's more about how you write your code to enable dependencies to be injected. You're not worried about how they get injected. You're writing your code to enable that. You're writing it loosely coupled. So that's where you're going to apply the uh, Uncle Bob stuff. To, to your coding. Inversion control is more of the act of injecting the dependencies. So your code is running independent of how the dependencies get injected. So Spring is an inversion of control container that your code runs in. So Spring is going to manage actually injecting the code, or the I should say the dependencies into your code. So you write the code, dependency injection is how you write your code, and the act of it uh, being injected or the control of it is inversion of control. So your code is turning over the control to something else to inject the dependencies into it. So that, that's why it's a, an inversion of control. But wait, there's more! There's actually more to inversion of control than just dependency injection, how the dependencies are being injected into your code. So this is called the Hollywood pr principle. It's a very common uh, object-oriented paradigm. So it's a don't call us, we'll call you. So I want you to consider this quote from Ralph Johnson and Brian Foote. Uh, they're both uh, a couple of guys that are like early pioneers in the thought leadership behind object-oriented programming. They're both big small talk guys, which is a 
precursor to uh, languages like C++ and Java. So what they say is one of the important characteristics of a framework is that the methods defined by the user to tailor the framework will often be called within the framework itself rather than from the user's application code. The framework often plays the role of the main program in coordinating and sequencing the application activity. This inversion of control gives frameworks the power to serve as extensible skeletons. The methods supplied by the user tailor the generic algorithms defined in the framework for a particular application. So if you think about this for a second, if you look at a web application using Spring MVC, you're going to write a controller uh, to re handle a web request. Now, the Spring Framework is going to handle managing the client, all the communications with the web browser. Uh, so you don't need to see any of that. Everything's like all all there, already parsed for you. It's even going to pull out uh, things like form parameters and stuff and pass it right into your controller. So you just say, this controller is listening on this URL, and you don't have to handle all the other stuff that goes around with it. So actually handling a re web request is fairly complex. Uh, the Spring MVC framework really abstracts a lot of that from you. So what we're going to do now is dive into some code. I want to show you some examples uh, in the Spring framework. Okay, this here is an this is an example uh, of a Spring code. I don't want you to get too hung up in what's going on here, but I was just talking about a uh, controller. So this is a Spring MVC controller. You can see at the top it's annotated with a controller method. Uh, in it, I'm getting a product service auto wired in, and you can see that I've mapped uh, the URL products. So when a GET request goes to the URL products, this method is going to be invoked. So uh, he's going to go out from the product service, get a list of all products, and then return uh, return a, a string product so the proper view is rendered. So pretty simple controller here, not a lot going on. But what I want, want you to take a look at is I have a product service that's being injected. So that's a, an example of dependency injection. Now I've written that product service to an interface. Okay. Now that interface, uh, here's the actual implementation of, of that product service. So you can see this is loosely coupled. It's written, written to an interface. And again, I have uh, dependency injection going on in this guy here. So I'm going to get a product repository and that's going to handle the database interaction. So if I take a quick look at the product re repository, I also have a, an interface and I'm using Spring Data JPA here, which is actually a really cool tool. Uh, but again, I'm injecting uh, using an interface for an injection. The Spring Framework is going to determine what to inject. Okay, so when I run this, everything gets wired up. Uh, with the proper stuff. So let's actually take a couple looks. Uh, look here. Okay, now I want, want to take a, a look here. So this is a unit test I've written. Okay, I'm using the Spock framework to test it, but what I want to show you here is I have my product service and product repository. So these are the two interfaces. Okay, I have a setup method that's going to run before each test. So I'm going to take a uh, the service, create a new service implementation. Now I'm going to use the Spock testing framework to create a mock of the product repository. And then I'm going to set that into the service. So in the, my test, I'm actually doing the dependency injection. So this runs completely outside the Spring framework. And just to give me an idea of what's going on here, um, this is Spock. It's a, a great uh, behavior-driven development or behavior-driven testing framework. And what I'm doing is I'm creating a, a variable called products and I'm saying to get get a list of products from the service and this here line is really confusing if you haven't seen Spock before but what's happening is I'm saying when my repository mock is called I want it to return uh, when it, the method find all is re called I want to return the list of products so now you remember my um, service I go in and take a, a look at that so my, my service class actually gets product repository injected okay so I'm injecting a mock in my test and then I'm, I'm providing a behavior on that mock uh, to mimic that that return okay so this here uh, 
test is just one example. So I'm writing a Spock mock to the product repository to use in my unit test. So that, that's completely different from what gets wired up, but since it inter implements that interface, it gets wired into the code and executes properly. So if I uh, run this now, we can see things pull up and my, my test will go ahead and pass. Okay, so basically my mock returned the list of products and it was executed one time so my test condition is happy. So now let's take another look at an actual integration test. Okay, now I'm bringing up a context configuration. Okay, so I'm invoking the Spring framework and I'm telling it to auto wire in a product repository. And now I'm going to do a, a list of operations against that. And here I'm testing Spring Data JPA and the various activities against that. So let's take a quick look at this guy running and we'll check out what he does. So now you can see in my, my test window, I'm getting a lot more stuff as far as uh, output. Okay, so behind the scenes, Spring is bringing up uh, an H2 embedded, embedded database. Uh, creating the spring data JPA stuff, injecting a repository into this. So uh, that's all the spring framework doing this for me. So when I said auto wired here and the context configuration, I'm bringing up a spring context. And before the test runs, spring is going to create a product repository and inject it in the class for me. And then all my tests will go ahead and pass. So uh, this is actually working with a, an H2 uh, database. So what I want you to understand is here's an example where I've written a unit test, a uh, true unit test, provided a mock, and I wrote it against that interface. Now I also have an integration test where I'm using Spring to manage the dependency injection for me. So, and Spring is taking the control. So in the first unit test, I was taking the control. In the integration test, Spring is using inversion of control and dependency injection to manage things uh, for me. And when this code actually runs as a web application, Spring again is going to handle that configuration for me. So if this was a, a production piece of code, that product repository might be wired up against a MySQL database or maybe even an Oracle database. Uh, but this section of code is still gonna behave the same. So none of this is dependent upon having MySQL or having an Oracle backend, it doesn't care. So it, the separations of concerns is not coupled. So I hope this uh, helped clarify the difference between uh, dependency injection and inversion control and hope you've, you're able to envision uh, how things uh, work all together.